bubble for just about 10 years. And to kind of tease you a little bit with what I'm going to talk about in the relevance of uh, CMS to us is that during that period, we have grown our customer base by over tenfold. Um, we've gone from one language to eight. We've jumped from one brand to 15 plus in growing. Um, we used to have, believe it or not, 40 web servers that were restarted frequently uh, when I came on board. Uh, we have uh, less than 10. Um, for our CMS servers, we have two, uh, funded by two Apache servers. We had a $20 million market cap when we, when I started about uh, 10 years ago, and now we're um, about a billion now. A couple years ago, we were about two billion. So we're, we're in that range. And what's interesting about this is that um, when you talk about an organization, a company that grows as much as we have grown, you talk about process changes, organizational changes, and through this tenure, we had three homegrown CMS systems that, that I championed for the company during our early period. And then we got bigger, um, the needs outgrew what we had, and so we began to look for um, solutions to, to handle the continued growth we were experiencing. And so this talk is going to kind of walk you through that story and hopefully benefit you all from some of the wisdom we gained from that experience. Um, <coughs> Some questions for you to think about. I'm not sure how much I will talk about these individually, but these are things that um, I will tease you with, and at the end, I'll leave any kinds of questions that I can talk at depth on any of these topics. You know, how do we garner support internally for CMS if you're struggling with that within an organization? Um, what about the process changes required to support CMS? How do we deal with that, and what are those? What about quality control, release management? IT that wants to lock down your production environment, not let you change anything, which is their duty. How do you deal with that? Uh, what is content? Uh, that's a big question. Um, what should be released through CMS without the rigor of, of um, quality control and the full software development process? Um, what about localization? How do you handle that? Roles and support, scalability, all those things. Um, I'd be happy to talk at length. I will try to hit some of those as we go through. Um, but let me talk first, beginning an introduction of who we are. J2 Global, um, we um, have been around for slightly over 10 years, um, a billion market cap. We have, uh, we basically have two primary services. There's more than two, but we have internet based faxing, and we are the leading, the world's leading provider of internet based fax solutions. So if you want to be able to send and receive faxes, and you don't want to have a fax machine or a fax farm, you come to us. We're the leading provider of that service. We make it really easy for you to do it. Um, and believe it or not, faxing is still. It is the single standard for if you want to receive a document anywhere, you just send it to a fax machine. So it's not real sexy, but it is practical. What we do is we make it for those who have computers to be able to send and receive without having a fax machine. We add a layer of functionality on top. For example, you can go ahead and uh, have your faxes stored online. You can, they're scanned, they're searchable. So there's lots of extra features we build on top of that. And we have a host of brands that we offer those services in. And each of those brands have a CMS need. So we'll talk, I'll talk about some of that. We also have a collection of voice services. Um, voice services in particular, if, uh, if the easiest way to explain is like a call center. If, um, if you're a small company and you have a need for, hello, you know, talk to press one to talk to customer service and press two to talk to marketing or whatever, um, we provide that entire layer without having a single phone. We can, you can have your cell phone, your own home phone. It's all masked under this virtual layer of a call center. And we let you program when, what calls go to where and so on. So we are leveraging our telephone inventory for both fax and a voice solution. We also have conference calling and everything. But the main point of this is you take our growth plus all these brands, and with these brands, there sits a marketing department, a product person, and guess what? They have a healthy appetite for tuning and optimizing what they do. So they need to be able to change quickly what they do, and for that, they, a CMS solution is a copy. Um, when to change. Uh, so I throw this one out. Um, adopting CMS was an interesting proposition. If you ask the marketing department um, 
did they want CMS about two and a half, three years ago, I'd say about half the people said, you know what, we really don't want CMS because we spent a lot of time thinking about what we do, planning our sites, it's a sign up funnel, all of our business is driven through the web, and for someone to go out there and just easily change content and not go through the rigor of thought of what it takes to optimize the site, it's, it's not something you take lightly. Um, on the other hand, there are situations where it's a burden for engineering to go ahead and be the bottleneck for that change. Um, eventually, the CMS won, won the debate and we decided to change. But I think window dock is a good question. If anybody remembers what this thing was, I'd say arguably it was ahead of its time, but perhaps not the best time to adopt. And it's costly if you adopt early. And so the question is when is that right time? And I'm going to try to make the argument of when and why that was the right time for us. But certainly if you adopt too early, it's going to cost you more. It's going to be, you're going to be dealing with lots of bugs. Is the organization ready? Um, <clears throat> and so on. And at some point, the technology becomes mainstream. And, and I think arguably CMS is there today. Um, and when it is mainstream, it's cheaper. You have lots of, part, lots of vendors to choose from. The IT departments are aware of the issues for integrating, for example, changing content live, which is can be an issue for an organization with all the kinds of Sarbanes-Oxley controls and governance that's, that's out there they have to deal with. Um, training is easier, support's more well established, and so on. So when was the right time for us to adopt CMS? Um, I'll say there's two things. And they're relatively recent time frames, so it's not, uh, for those who are considering adopting this, um, certainly we were not ready to do this more than a couple of years ago. But the two pieces for us that became important were, um, one is we wanted a standard-based format for CMS. If you go to a vendor that had their own proprietary format and were locked in, that was a non-starter. Not only did you, not, not, not only did the prices scare us, but the fact that, that they had our all of our content, that scared us even more. Um, well, there was the emergence of a standard um, in 2005. Uh, it matured in 2007. Was the first implementation with Jackrabbit for a content repository standard. Um, so that was important for us. The other thing was important. Having the standard content management was one thing, but really, a lot of our sites are interacting with backend systems, and unless we dealt with that, the ability to handle them data gracefully within a content management system was also a requirement. And I think that um, the emergence of AJAX more recently, uh, you know, started in 2004 and five with Gmail and Google Maps. Everybody kind of was made teased with the wonderful functionality that kind of came on board, which actually was leveraging technology that was hidden in existence for time, much time before that. But once people saw this, there then was you know, a draft of the standard for what it was to handle AJAX was in 2006. Um, there were very crude tools that you can go ahead and, and leverage uh, 2006 and 2007. But really, the community rallied very quickly around producing a set of tools for highly reusable widgets that could then be incorporated within it technology like CMS, and that really didn't happen until the last couple of years. And so for us, adopting was, I think it was 2007, and then we've um, been aggressively integrating the, the reusable widgets that have been recently kind of uh, enhanced uh, out in the market. Um, listening to the talk yesterday with Kathleen Healy, uh, I think her name was, she talked about five different um, factors that her survey of when people were considering and choosing a CMS. One was cost, and definitely that was an issue for us. We were not going to go into the proprietary expensive uh, million dollar system. We just didn't have the appetite for that. We were back, back in our growth curve, we were, we were a fairly small company. We couldn't even consider that. Um, second was uh, the ability to um, customize. Uh, our sites are very important to us. It's our brand. It's, which it's the experience that we have when you come to us. And if we don't do it right, you'll go easily to the next site. And we needed to have the ability to completely do exactly what we wanted to do. Our site development process was we have a very talented creative department. They would hand us a spec, and we formally would implement it exactly. So we didn't want to have a cookie cutter set of templates that maybe would be good for a, a mom and pa shop website. And, and you can put a logo on it. We really needed to have full control over exactly how that site was going to look. And so for us, what was important is 
and have a CMS system that provides us with the flexibility that we can create the templates to do exactly what we wanted to do, and we could do it quickly. Um, so the approach we took, I don't know how much of this is of interest, but basically this is how we couple them together. Um, technically from the model, we have a request coming in from the web page, it goes over to uh, the CMS system, which handles all of the, the, the content, so here's all your page content. Um, and what's neat about Magnolia, which is what we adopted, is it allows you to put filters in front of the request to capture the request before and after the content is fetched and, and then delivered out from the platform. These are critical for us because it meant that if we wanted to customize anything about the request, handle session management, drop cookies, do all that kind of stuff, which you have to do for, a log, for any kind of site that you log on and have a user experience for, this is how we were able to do it. Um, another good example is, for example, we use Akamai for all of our, um, Akamai is a very fast delivery uh, framework for providing um, content at the edge. Well, that means all the URLs have to be friendly for your images to Akamai. So we were able to simply put a filter that took all of the kind of native, clean, integral URLs within the content management system, which knew nothing about Akamai, and made it very Akamai friendly. So they have the ability to very flexibly tune Magnolia so it can do not just those things, but handle things like AD tracking, pixel tracking, the dynamic telesales content that has to be universal across our site. Lots of marketing things that we had built up prior to adopting CMS we need to have is have to have for this content management system. So this system allowed us to do that. So basically the user makes a web request goes through the CMS, we'll have all our filters to do exactly what we want. We deliver basically back a stateless page to the user. The stateless page then will then make back-end calls to our um, Ajax API servers, which then deliver JSON responses back, which handles all the dynamic data. And then we use the Ajax widgets to, to, to show that. So here's an example. Um, <coughs> this is our eFax sign-up funnel where you are given the opportunity to choose a fax number. So we can either choose the international member. In this case, it's got the, the looking at US. You can type in your zip code, your state, or look for toll free. If you choose the state option, you put the city or the state. And voila, we go to the back end and we fetch all of the cities that we have inventory that you can choose your fax number. Well, this is not something that belongs in CMS. This is back end content. But what's neat is this whole widget is content. And that's where it's an interesting debate because some would say, that's really kind of like a little mini application. Should you be messing with changing that in a live production system? What we did is um, we allow ourselves to do it, but we use Magnolia to have roles such that the content that's on this, for example, the little uh, marketing blurbs, the phone numbers, the, the, the panoramas, and so on, those are all CMS standard text kind of things that marketing department can point and change with. This kind of content is also content, but we have different role access that the developers have access to that, and we will force QA to go ahead and review the integrity of that experience, because if that's broken, we lose customers through the sign-up process. But what's neat is, and what really turned the engineering group over to being a full supporter, is that A, it relieved us from maintaining all of the, I mean, engineers are not real excited about maintaining copy for, for engineering. I mean, they like to write code. So it relieved us from doing all this kind of content management, and it gave us the flexibility for, in some instances, where it could be that you could change the JavaScript that builds these widgets safely in a production environment without having to go through formal QA if you can have QA spot check in an author mode in production. So in some cases, we'll go through a formal full QA release with all the features. In other cases, we'll treat this content. And this, this, this combination has actually turned out to be quite powerful. Sometimes you make mistakes, but then with CMS, you can roll back it. Here's another example. Um, I don't know if I'll have time, but I, th this is our message center. So this is a pretty, it's similar to Yahoo like man. It's an interface where when you receive a fax, it comes to your inbox. Um, you can open up your inbox. Uh, click on any uh, of the faxes. You can search. You can tag your faxes. You can, each fax is OCR in the back end, so you can search for keywords. This entire piece is actually content in the CMS system. It's a collection of JavaScript widgets that we've had. We don't like to make those changes much in production, but if we want to, we can. So it's given us great flexibility. Formerly, what we would have to have done is collect all of the bugs, feature requests, package them up into a full release, go through the full release cycle, and it could be that a relatively simple feature, like maybe adding a new column, 
that shows sorting by caller ID that wasn't formally there, we can consider adding if it's safe enough to exploit APIs that may already be delivering that data but the UI is not showing. We can make those kind of changes in CMS uh, fairly straightforward. <coughs> so I'm trying to point out that, that the engineering and traditional software development group can be as much of a customer of CMS as the marketing engine and marketing and product is. Um, so here are the benefits. Um, certainly from a technical perspective, we can, my group can spend more time writing code and less time on content, which is good. Um, it also means the sites are more atomically built. We can focus really on designing our APIs to do here's fact server set of APIs, here's a voice set of service APIs, slice and dice what makes sense to maintain them straightforwardly. Um, it also means that we have fewer what I call site releases where we bundle up new functionality that might be exposing new services in the back end. We can spend the time to do it right and have less frequent releases that build new features that are actual what I would call service features um, because the CMS allows the marketing product folks to go ahead and add new sign up tests if they want to try a new sign up funnel. They can do all that in production using CMS for that. Um, but from an engineering perspective, we don't need to deploy the full site out to production as frequently. And finally, it lets business customers manage their own content. Um, we're no longer perceived as the enemy. We're, we're, we're the partner with our customer. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that you know, this talk is all about CMS in this conference. You're, you're going to see, if you go to a, a, a business process management conference, you'll see a very similar argument. It, engineering and IT are bottlenecks to not only content management on the web, but they're also a bottleneck to business logic that's on the back end. And what BPM is doing for the business logic, CMS is doing for web content. Um, and you'll hear this, you know, IT is a bottleneck. You see, you'll change quickly. Well, now you can't. Well, with CMS, you can. Um, we've designed our site so that we allow A-B testing to happen, so we can have a sign-up funnel with two paths. They measure performance uh, simultaneously, and then we, what we learn, we will steer traffic to the one that works, and we'll we continually change, test, learn, change. Um, it allows us to respond to the market quickly. Um, and when things happen, there's two, two examples I'll give you. Uh, we had one change on a billing page where we asked for your credit card, and we gave the reason, we, we'll give you a free trial, a 30 day free trial, we asked for a credit card. We'll say, well, we need a credit card because, and we had some verbiage, and it wasn't that long from my perspective, it was maybe a sentence. Well, they changed it from what it was to a sentence that said, um, we need your credit card to help prevent fraud. That one change increased the Senate conversion 35%. And we couldn't have, I mean, I'm not sure anyone would have predicted that change would have been so powerful. But the nice thing about CMS is you can make a change like that and it happens. Another change was with our voice offering, uh, it, it sounds pretty simple to have a layered virtual greeting center, but trying to explain to somebody in a three-step sign-up process what that means, there's lots of bells and whistles, there's conference tones, all kinds of things. So it's a real challenge to boil it down to something simple. One of the things we were doing was talking about number of extensions you can manage and so on. We took all of that stuff out and said, you know what, we'll set you up with a default package and if you want to customize it, you can do it after you have a product. By making that change to the sign-up funnel, again, another 30% increase in sign-up. So those two things alone amounted for a 50, over 50% conversion. Um, and those two things were the benefits we experienced this last year. Okay, um, what kinds of things were we looking for? I'm not sure this is an exhaustive list, but something to cause you to think about. Certainly workflow is important. Who's going to have access to CMS? How is the workflow managed? We definitely wanted to have a standards-based CMS repository so that we can go ahead and um, it, it belongs to J2 and if we would choose to go to a different system, it's something that we can migrate if we need, if we, if we need to. We're not going to be locked into a particular um, the ability to define usable page templates. The next series of bullets deals with, really, we need to have full control over building these templates. Typically, when we come up with a new brand, and the way we acquire customers more recently is we'll, we'll just simply buy some of our competitors. And, and so now, all of a sudden, my group's in charge of well, how do we maintain their websites for that brand. Um, 
we need the ability to go ahead in the case of rebuilding the sites, the look and feel of, of, of the brand that we've acquired, um, we'll pass it on to our creative department. They'll spend anywhere from two weeks to four weeks coming back with a full set of comps of what it takes to read you know, um, color that brand. And it might take my team, and my team has both presentation and back-end coder, but the presentation coder might take one person a couple weeks to build out the skin that represents like what um, you saw the first day what, when um, Matt was at the, the uh, mass.gov, they talked about the importance of having a uniform brand. That whole concept, front to back for a site, will take our presentation folks anywhere from two to four weeks to build out. And from there, you can throw on as many pages as you want, we'll have a consistent look and feel. Um, and that's for us really controlling very precisely exactly what the site's going to look like. I think that, I, I know that there are templates that come with Magnolia and with some of the other SEMA systems out there, that if you want an existing set of templates, you can use them. But right now, when you talk to our creative department, they want everything. I mean, they want full control. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. Smart page caching. Um, of course, caching enhances speed, and what, and, and since now we're dealing with this Ajax world, a lot of what you see can be based on how you came to the site. So what offer did you come in with? Um, what language are you looking at? And so the caching of the page needs to be a function for us as a function of certain cookie names and values as well as parameter sets. Um, and with Magnolia, we're able to, to inject that kind of uh, level of caching. Um, in terms of requests, I think I've already talked about this. One of the things that we do is that we don't, we didn't, we didn't do an all or nothing. We started off with our own homegrown CMS systems, which handle both the sales, sign up, and back end portions of our site. But what we, but the low hanging fruit was not to put CMS into our back end my account section. Um, the low hanging fruit was sales and sign up, which is what they wanted to change quickly. So what we actually did is we used rewrite rules so that we, from the user's perspective, it's seamless, it's one site. But actually in the back end, the systems that run the legacy portion that we do handling the My Account section are actually on the non-CMS sites. They're the lower in the queue to get ported over. What we've done is we've ported over all the sales and sign up portions of our sites. And we use rewrite rules to make it look like it's all coming from the same place. Um, and that's been very effective for us. So it's, it's, it's meant though, after you, if you look at those 15 brands, Instead of doing one brand going into the next, we're doing the most, the most attractive brands first, but just the sales and sign up, marching through all there, and then we're coming backward to kind of hit the, the my accounts in a second. Um, <coughs> what else? Tracking pixels, um, it's important. I, I think there was one slide on the first day also that the, uh, the, the folks from, um, from Philips had that big slide that showed you all the 15 giant marketing tools that a marketing person has to deal with. Uh, I, I believe it. We, we, our group deals with all that. You know, Gomez or, offer, or AB for, or Gomez for tracking. Um, you have a whole myriad of, of tools that, that they use. And so um, one of the things is tracking pixels. You need to be able to allow the marketing folks to be able to specify tracking pixels on a page however they want. And so having a tool to be able to inject those is something that we, we integrated within, within Manual Analytics quite, quite nicely. Um, of course, we went from one language to eight, and now we're moving more than that this next year. Um, we need to be, we certainly have to be multi-byte support capable and be aware of the localization needs. And we've developed a whole localization strategy, which really for only a hand, let, let two to three people across all these brands, we maintain all these sites in all the country. And we're able to do it very, very, very efficiently. Um, I'm curious if I would spend, spend an hour with folks in Phillips about their localization approach. But, but our, generally our approach has been gold standard, one language, be able to kind of translate across all the languages. But with CMS, we're able to tune each language translation according to the needs of that particular language and locale. And finally, a requirement for us was Java-based. We were a Java-based shop, and we have something in Java. Um, so let me look at some of our sites and what to notice. I, I've already talked about the mixture of what I call static content, which is what you typically think of as CMS as the, as the, uh, the images and the text. I think of that as static content versus the content that's coming from the back end, which might be your personalized data and account database somehow. Um, 
But what we tried to do is look at all of, we, we would get all the comps from Creative, and we would put them all together and say, okay, what's the minimum set of templates we can create that generically represents everything that you're trying to do? Um, and what I've kind of here is, is give an example of, of a slice and dice. We have single column, I think this is a single, 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 you know, we have a panoramic single column with a bunch of content with a footer. You have side, single, double sidebar, single sidebar. And of course, the most popular template of all is the one that lets them do exactly what they want and ignore all of this. And having gone through three generations of homegrown systems, where we've actually gone out to the creative part and said, give us everything you've ever done and we'll generalize that to a template. We come back with that generalization, and the very next thing that they develop breaks all of their formal rules and it doesn't work. So we've learned our lesson that you've got to provide the flexibility because eventually creative guys are going to do what they want to do. They're going to, new technologies are going to come around, new widgets, and they're going to want to do their own thing. So we, we, we kind of you know, held their nose and made available this thing, which lets them do whatever they want. I'm going to kind of rifle through a couple of shots of our sites, which all are in CNS, just to give you kind of a, a notion of the kinds of layout and content we have. These are all on CMS. So here's a single sidebar, navigation on the top. Navigation on the top, in this particular case, a requirement was navigation on the top could drill down and there would be a secondary navigation. Items on the top navigation as you drill down could either go to a secondary page or a document. All of that kind of flexibility about what happens in navigation in terms of whether it shows in secondary, what is named on the sidebar versus the navigation are all customizable within the CMS environment. Not sure that's a great site design approach to do that, but that was a requirement for the site and that's how we built it. Um, single sidebar again on the right. Here you have the double sidebar content down the middle. And the content that they were interested in, you know, our requirement for the content for here was basically anything that was. And you see a little bit of mystery in that. So what we try to do is come up with a set of style sheets, CSS sheets, for the site, a basic layout, and we give the, our customer, which is the marketing and product department, complete flexibility about how they can you know, change that. Um, this, this is our eFax sign up funnel, and it's maybe kind of hard to see on the screen, but I just wanted to show you here's our panorama. The first thing you see when you come to our site, the top left, you eventually work your way down to this is what I showed you earlier, the ability to choose a number. At some point, we actually give you numbers to choose, which will one of three numbers based on the area code you selected, and finally you work your way your billing page and then you have a number. Well, you have an example of you know, Ajax content for picking out the numbers from inventory, presenting the user with actual numbers from the inventory that they can start their experience with, um, all the requirements for, for billing and validation of credit card data. That's our sign-up funnel. <laughs> it's relatively straightforward, but it's clean, it's user experience is, is straightforward, all of this is in CMS. Um, and then the rest of the pages that, that um, these are samples, and this is more honest, but there are other pages that support the, uh, there's one of the sales pages in the site. But you get an idea of the, again, single sidebar, in this case, two columns. These are all expandable uh, Ajax widgets, which lets you see more content, the ability to sign up, lost pin, forgot pin. So you have kind of tab based widgets in order to show different data. All of this is within the CMS environment. Uh, a different brand, this is our voice, one of our voice products. And you'll kind of glean a similar look in this situation. How do we do that within Magnolia specifically? It's actually fairly straightforward. It's uh, here in their author environment, they expose a, a, a hierarchy of all of the pages for the site and a, and a basically a tree. Um, for any given page, you can, on this template tab, have a drop down to choose from any template you've defined to be available for the site. So if I want to have Effects, Effects International, double column, I can choose that. So the blank page template. You define the templates as you want. It makes it really easy for the, for the presentation and the marketing folks to choose new pages to create the, to assign the template they want. And then when you double click on it, a boom, it opens up an editor and lets you go cranking away with, a, with that template being seeded with all the navigational stuff that that template would have demanded. So you can move pages around, import, export, um, and then finally, if you're done with your editing of the page, this is where you actually activate. You can activate the page, and then someone else reviews it, and finally, it publishes out the page. It's pretty straightforward. 
One thing I will say, the adoption process, um, I wish that, 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 and I was the one who did the vendor selection in, in this particular case, I, I wish I had the luxury of like a six month vetting process. I, can, I, had, I had less than a month to look to see what's out there, to download, to without you know, help from the vendor, to install, to put a demo, to go to our executives to say this is what CMS can do for you. And by the way, since we did it so quickly, it's not very expensive. That was part of our sales, that was part of my sales up my channel to sell CMS in the, in the company. Um, and that's what we did with Magnolia. We, we basically, in less than a month's time frame, uh, looked at their, what they had, downloaded their community version, uh, explored with it, created some templates, showed how it worked, and that's what got the ball rolling. Um, <coughs> now, what was nice about this particular uh, package is that you can pretty much customize exactly what is changeable, because it's not just content, right? It's not just images and text. There's, in the case of pages, there's descriptions, there's keywords, there's title, there's all the pixel tracking type of information, navigation options. You can define any option or any, any parameter that you want to expose as a, as a um, tangible item on that page and make that an attribute that you're then our customer marketing product can simply just click, oh, I want this or I don't want that. It's very simple. But you can define those as opposed to having locked into a set of templates that you kind of get what you get and that's it. And that not just goes to the page level, but down to each individual widget on the page. You can define your own editors for your own custom content. And so we've grown with wisdom on how to apply that, but the nice thing is it's complete flexibility. As an example, uh, this, you define the tabs that show. So on a particular page, if I look at the page properties, here's the actual user experience for being able to establish the title bar text. We had free field. Here's the text, here's the description, here's the keywords. That's it. You want to go ahead and look at, in this case for our corporate site, we have five different classes of users who come to our site. Admins who control giant corporate accounts. We have um, um, paid users who are actually our corporate customers' employees who then go to the site. We have um, free users. We have new users. And the experience on what they're allowed to see and what they're not allowed to see and do on the site, we can control. And so we, we basically define those roles, expose them as an option that whoever's creating a page can determine what they're able to see or not. So this wasn't something that we had to force ourselves into an existing model. It was we created the model and we were able to stand it up. And so when I talk about the two to four week process for building out a site, I'm talking about not just the page, you know, the templates, but it's also the controls that you want to customize on the full site experience. Um, here's another one that talks about our, I think this is all of our um, tracking. This was a before picture. This is what we first did, which is pretty messy. Um, we literally have the site catalyst code, uh, Gomez account information, the domains, and so on. That's what we had initially. Well, this is what we now have. You get to click three things, and under the hood, JavaScript that does all those things gets done for you. But so the nice thing is, with, you know, we learned too, we can put out a model for how we want to control behavior we think is good, we'll get feedback, and we can modify it next time. Um, so lessons. Uh, for us, we'll start simple and show results early. So again, having a hybrid approach where the portions that you want to focus for the highest value of CMS, do those first. Your problem will be simpler, you get the highest bang for the buck lots of visibility, and that helps. Uh, and rewrite rules is how we did that with the patches of yours. Um, creative and marketing groups are your friends, or our friends, but we were, we were not necessarily perceived that way before CMS uh, involved them. So they, 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 ha they can provide input into uh, what you're doing. Um, planning roles that will emerge, that's actually still an ongoing process. We're actually now to the point where we have enough different CMS authors out there that the idea of creating a community, policing how they do work, user groups within the company, we're getting to that point. Um, and we'll, we'll get smarter as we go along. I don't know that we would have the wisdom to know how to plan all those roles in advance, but we do realize that's going to happen. Uh, this is probably a, a very charged, um, if you want to stir up some conversation, you can either talk politics or religion, or you can talk about what content is. Uh, uh, so we have, uh, from the engineering point, we, we have pushed the envelope. 
I don't know that IT fully knows that, but we have pushed the envelope. But we, we are dealing with the issue that it's not just for copy, and it literally, because of the advent of Ajax widgets, you really can do a lot. And some of the things that, um, there's going to be gray areas, and how, how do you decide to navigate through that? Legal considerations is another one. Uh, the importance will be able to customize your site. Well, what happens with you know someone who challenges perhaps to the company and says, hey, you know, I signed up four years ago and my service agreement said this. CMS system, are you recording that? We have certain pages that have legal requirements that if it gets changed, legal gets notified. It goes to a separate system, we archive it. If there's ever in the future a question, we come back to it. And you may not think it's important, but when you get bigger, believe me, it, people will find a way to explore every nook and cranny of what you've done. Um, successes. I've showed you the, some of the, the EFAC site, a little bit of EFAC's corporate, and one of our e-voice sites. Another interesting area we've done, we've actually taken Magnolia, and we use it to do CMS across all of our email templates. So we have an entire email system that we've layered a content management approach on top of all of our, so we have over 500 different email templates, believe it or not, but in part because of the eight languages. Um, and all of those are in CMS. And so we, we, we have the ability to, because we were able to control exactly what a template meant, our template for an email concluded both HTML and plain text and allowed users through the CMS environment to go ahead and change that. And eventually it goes out to our rendering farm where we actually handle all the emails, but we have incorporated a web-based content management tool to actually author all of our email content. I didn't hit a lot of those, but I, I hope that I We've invited enough interest there for the questions and happy to entertain. Well, I think that when, when I showed you the adoption period, um, notice that 1.1 of anything is pretty, pretty early, right? 1.1 is only released in October 2006. That's only three years ago. So you have a standard that's created, you know, in, I don't know when the standard was, but the first implementation of the standard was Jackrabbit, 1.1. I think when we came on board, we were at 1.3. So we hit bugs and things that had to do with Jack, I mean, Magnolia's built on top of Jackrabbit, so we were dealing with underlying issues with the immaturity of, I don't want to say immaturity, but just the early period. We weren't a 1.1 user, but we were 1.3 and suffering for some of that. I, I think part of the approach is start simple. And start, start. You know, if you try to do an entire site, you, the risk is higher that there's maybe something you'll run into a problem with, just because of the scope of your problem. But in our case, you saw our sign-up process. We try to make our sign-up process three steps. It's one, two, three. There's a lot that goes on in those three steps. But if we can start with our sales pages and our sign-up pages, we really limited the scope of what we were, where we were applying. And then in, inevitably, you saw the, the the editor with the two versions of how we expose controls. If we have controls for a giant site. You're not going to get it right the first time, but if you start small, you iterate, you'll get smart with it. The, the nice thing about um, with Magnolia is it's you know, we were able to completely customize a lot of these things. Um, it takes time. Uh, what we did as part of our engagement with Magnolia is they came out for I think it was a week, I can't remember if it was a week or two weeks, um, and uh, they sat with us as part of our actually our vetting but a process as well, but, but they sat with us and really helped us um, through the first couple weeks and then we're there to answer questions and so forth. So having that assistance is worthwhile. I mean, you're not, with open source vendors, you're not necessarily paying the vignette type giant fees, right? But it's worthwhile to have help for a week or two. And if you need longer than that, great. But I mean, because you get the benefit of an expert who knows exactly how the system works. Your engineers are going to be quite comfortable with all of the technology. If you're in Java shop and you've already vetted that, they'll pick it up. So you just pair them together and, and you'll get there. But I, I'd say that um, if, if you were maybe, maybe a bit 
it was interesting in, in, the, in, the, in the talk, there was um, in the talk where 40% of people raised their hands who adopted CMS, when it came to questions, there was none. This is a reflection of the do-it-yourself crowd, right? Everyone thinks they can do it themselves. Well, that's, don't, don't be foolish to not to ask for help. But I, I, I'd say that, um, that you're in a much better situation than we were with the maturity of the product. And not just, it's not just Magnolia sitting on top of the track but there's other, other solutions that sit on top as well. So you're dealing with tried and trusted, tried and trusted. Uh, The Magnolia allows you to define any template you want under the, and they come with templates, but under the hood, there is a JSP page married with every content fragment and every page template. So you can, if you, under, under the hood for how Magnolia works, if there is a JSP page associated with a page template, you can use the out of the box templates, which case you don't have to do anything. Okay. Well, um, so what, the way we've handled the level of widget granularity is that we tried initially to have JSP fragments to implement each little widget in the page. Because basically in Magnolia, the whole page is JSP, and every template fragment can have a JSP fragment associated with it as an include. The problem that we found is that when we started building these fancy widgets, is that with all these custom fix things, is we well, want to change it. Well, that means you've got to redeploy the site. So we've really kind of moved away from that more to actually using full Ajax JSP and, and the JavaScript to implement our widgets. So that's why we actually can change the production because it's, and the maturity of those widgets is fantastic. So I, I would challenge that if you can't find a widget class out there in Ajax that does what you need, there's this, there's, there's tons. You had your... Well, you think the wars are bad ones, CMS. Wait till the BPM hits the IT department. We're, we've, we're recently adopting that. That's going to even be worse. Um, sometimes they don't know, which is not a great answer. But uh, what, 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 uh, what, what um, IT, you know, it's, it's, it's gone back and forth. I mean, initially, we, you know, put out the site. You have a bit of night TV. There's a bit, you know, IT and, and actually our initial customers are a bit naive about what's out there. They don't really know what they don't know. And so initially trying to get things to work our first sites, we gave ourselves access to go change things. Works all great, but then certain other things don't work, so it exposes that, so then you get into a little bit of a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cycle. Um, I think that what we eventually ended up doing is we've established the ability with the roles, we can assign roles for every page or section of the site. And we say for these pages, these people are allowed to make changes. And all of the JavaScript which sits in our the document management repository inside Magnolia specifically has a different set of roles for the JavaScript. And we simply just said, okay, we will go through the formal QA process in, in production CMS. Because you have in CMS production author and production you know, public facing view of the site. So if we decide to go ahead and change content that is warranting of QA, and we've locked it out because it has different access privileges for making edits to that. Because our, our JavaScript, all of our sign-up stuff is in the JavaScript file. So you mess it up, if you screw it up, you've messed up the entire sign-up experience. Um, so we will, we will have a QA person sit along a present, presentation engineer who works on maintaining the site in hand with the marketing folks. So we have actually created a te cross-functional team whose job it is to maintain the sites in production. So we talk about organizational changes, that's how eventually you get to this. because. If you start off the traditional model, you know, engineering throws it over the fence, the IT puts it out in production, you walk away. Well, you can't have that. If you're going to start changing code in production, you need to have a cross-functional team that can deal with that and define ahead of time. And, and, and 
and at some point you have to really agree that you're going to give flexibility to the group to do what they want. If you handcuff them too much, you're not going to get any creativity. And so it's just having a kind of a common sense approach. If you give people and empower them with the ability to make change in a process that gives them some guidance, I think that's how you optimize it. But you are going to be times when you stumble and you have to be able to defend and you do the right thing. And Yeah, no. So we 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 uh, so we 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 have a because we're very brand conscious and uh, and we're not like the mass.gov where I imagine they have hundreds of editors, right? And a relatively some relatively straightforward brand appearance. So my guess is their their scale is way different than ours. We have relatively few pages, very tight control through even before it gets to engineering over what the brand supposed to look like. So you're talking about people who are not going to just yeah, I just decided to change the privacy agreement, you know, and it goes without notice. We, we, that does not happen. So we don't have the problem of lots of different content people and trying to, trying to kind of rein in the cats about how much content they want to change. But I think that the answer to that would be groups, working groups, where you have to build structure and a process around that. It, 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 it creates its own needs. Unfortunately for us, we're still a relatively small engineering group to support and maintain us, and a relatively small uh, marketing and product group, even though we have lots of brands and lots of customers, it's not it's not a real large set of users yet. But um, for large sites, I can see you can have CMS and you get lots of junk. You know, what goes in goes out. And I think there you have to have process for really, uh, just like Creative, before Creative even hands us a comp for a whole site, they vetted that thing in and out. That same kind of vetting should happen on the content side. And I think there was a, a talk one of the guys talked about the whole content specialist. A name that no one really raised their hand to volunteer that they were actually doing, but that actual role is going to be important for what you're talking about. Pixel tracking basically is the ability to drop a pixel, which actually goes out to a different you know, tool, and to be able to have the parameter controls over that particular pixel. So the data driving it really depends upon where the tracking pixel source ultimately is. All we've done is recognize that, that they want control on a site by page by page basis. We allow them to turn on, turn on or off. They don't worry about the JavaScript that we have to put in the page that does that. We encapsulate that within the page template. Yeah, so it's exactly right. Correct. I mean, in our initial stab at that was that you could actually put the JavaScript in every single page, and then of course when they change their API and then every page is, so we actually have a global JSP just for the template that talks to these different vendors, and we activate it with the custom parameters on a page by page basis. And those are the kind of things you just learn as you go, go along. But they're, if you don't have that in the tool, it's a non, for us it's a non-starter. Because you, marketing cannot function without that data. And so you have to have it. No, the, the, the bigger issue for us in terms of development is localization, for example. We, 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 um, we have our international team that has a healthy appetite for having every site and every language be completely what it wants to be. And we said, well, you know what? <coughs> you give us the gold template in a language, we will seed every single site up with English, but under the, all the localized URLs, you trans we have relationships with vendors, they can customize the content however they want and put the, the localized copy in there. Um, uh, go back to your question, because I, I don't know. I, I, uh, ah. Okay, so so you can edit content on 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 certainly on different pages concurrently. Um, we don't have that many. I'm just trying to think of different cases where you would have two people editing the same page at the same time. Uh, we don't have as many different authors that would begin. I mean, think about it. How many times would you have? Two people editing, in our case, fairly critical pages in the Senate process, and one's not talking to the other. 
Usually it's the last step. Um, where it does become a challenge is like, this is where we're going on the international example. So in development, we'll stand up the entire, like our e-voice reception site um, in different languages. And we want our customer marketing and product to actually fill out all the international content. We'll set up a template for them based on how the site and the should be. And now then, eventually this all has to be released out. We have to sync up all that content in our builds. And that sometimes can be messy because you get into bootstrap files where you're exporting the content, Someone's exported the content, but they did it before someone made a change, and so you missed their changes. And that, that just becomes controls and people talking. We, we actually will do, in, we have um, in our deployment itself, we have the bootstrap files with all of the content the site starts with. So the site, the site comes up, <laughs> it then imports immediately, not just Actually, it's, it's everything. It's our filters, it's our configuration, the users, all of that are in different bootstrap files. And what we do in development is we, and we have different people then in different, because we're now developing on individual machines and we have to aggregate this into a single set of bootstrap files. It's that where you can get people stepping on each other. And we just try to manage it. People are gatekeepers. And, but eventually, when it goes to QA, there's no question. It's one site, a set of bootstrap files, they fully QA everything that goes on that. But we're not doing this import in production. If we are, you have to, if, well, if you make a template change that, that requires a database, or actually it requires a JavaScript, I mean, a, a JSP change, you have to redeploy that JSP page. We will not allow those JSP pages to be changed on the fly. So the whole site will have to go through this. So generally, and, that, and that's why we, we are very careful about the generality of those templates. And we actually, the ones I showed you are across pretty much all of our brands. We have a handful of templates, there aren't that many. We started off with custom widgets, custom templates, and realized, you know, they get outdated before they're practically released. Thank you, Eric.